going to begin today with the photograph that I showed you last week of Arthur Morgan and his uh, adversary at the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, David Lilienthal. Now, Professor Billington noted uh, last week that, uh, that the, the rivalry between these two men led to, uh, led to Lilienthal in his history of the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, editing Arthur Morgan out of photographs. That was the level of enmity between the two men that developed. Um, it tells you something about David Lilienthal that he would be willing to, to, to revise history uh, in effect by, by editing a photograph to eliminate a person. What does that say about, uh, about the, the view of history to edit someone out of a, uh, of a photograph? It really changes the entire perception that one has. Uh, but we shouldn't be judgmental, uh, or too judgmental at least. This is really the, the, the full picture um, of the three directors of the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, the two dressed in white, the northerners uh, coming down to colonialize uh, Tennessee, and then Arthur Morgan, the lone southerner on the Tennessee Valley Authority Board of Directors. Uh, Arthur Morgan had been the president of the University of Tennessee, um, and he brought a particular uh, vantage point to the Tennessee Valley Authority that was different uh, from those of both Arthur Morgan, to whom he was not related, <laughs> Uh, and David Lilienthal. Uh, so one of, the, one of the stories that we should, in fact, bring out is the, uh, the, the, the story from the perspective of Arthur Morgan. And from his perspective, uh, rural electrification and cheap power was an important story. But he was most interested uh, in agriculture. And what I show here is, um, is a picture that appeared in TVA uh, advertising material for their programs, and what it shows is pre-TVA farming activities. Now, the thing that I want you to note is that here's a farmer in the in hill country of Tennessee uh, plowing with primitive uh, agricultural implements up and down the hillsides. The thing that you can see over on the other side are these, uh, these wide areas. Th those are gullies that form from poor agricultural practice. And what this farmer is doing is precisely the practice at the time. You just plow downhill uh, into the creeks. And it led to, uh, it led to a tremendous erosion um, and despoiled the land for the purposes uh, of agriculture. So uh, the, the vantage point uh, of Harcourt Morgan was that uh, agriculture would remain the most important aspect uh, of life in the Tennessee Valley uh, even after uh, electrification. And so improvements in agriculture. And this is the image the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, presents of improvements in agriculture. So modernization and mechanization of agriculture uh, and improved um, uh, conservation practices. So here, well, if you're going to uh, live and farm in the Tennessee Valley region, you're going to farm uh, on steep slopes. At least what you need to do is uh, practices like contour plowing, which are shown here. Instead of plowing downhill, you plow the contour of the terrain. Uh, so Harcourt Morgan introduced um, agricultural practices that reduced erosion, led to higher crop yield. And that was another focus of the Tennessee Valley Authority. It had this conservation element that was a part of uh, many of the early 20th century uh, water developments. Water development went hand in hand uh, with other aspects of resource management and resource conservation. Um, by far, though, the main impacts of the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, followed from the structural developments of the river basin. And between 1930 and 1950, uh, nearly 30 major dams were constructed uh, within the Tennessee River Valley Basin. Um, and this just shows the, the main structure of um, facilities that were created. And it was indeed a system uh, of reservoirs that ser served m multiple purposes. Uh, flood control uh, and electric production uh, were uh, churned out to be two of the most important. Um, you, you can almost see from this diagram uh, Morgan's perspective from the Tennessee Valley Authority, where he effectively provided headwater reservoirs right upstream of Dayton on the major tributaries. Well, the thing, same thing's done for Chattanooga here. Chattanooga just upstream of the Chickamauga Dam, 
So the dams, uh, the Norris Dam, the first uh, on the Clinch River, and then uh, the series of major flood control structures that were built on the tributaries uh, as the main line of defense and flood control. And just a few pictures of these. So this Norris Dam, the first, during flood control operations, water spilling uh, from the gates and the pool up to full conservation level. Fontana Dam uh, coming out of the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, on the Little Tennessee River. This is the highest dam uh, in the Tennessee River. Hiwassee Dam also uh, on the, from the east flowing portion uh, from the Blue Ridge Mountain area. Uh, another tall dam in high terrain. Uh, and then the dam on the French Broad River here in the, uh, in the valley, so Douglas Dam uh, controls the French Broad in its low gradient portion within the Tennessee Valley. <coughs> and then finally the Cherokee Dam, which is on the Holston River, also within the valley. So these were, these were the main series uh, of dams that were built uh, principally for flood control, uh, but also for power production. And then there are the series of dams uh, on the main stem Tennessee itself. This is the Chickamauga Dam uh, just upstream of Chattanooga. Uh, so this system uh, of dams and reservoirs uh, serve flood control, power production, and navigation purposes. Um, they also were the focus of the soil conservation activities that were an important part of the way uh, the water resource was managed. So flood control was organized around this, these series of major headwater dams uh, that collected the floodwaters uh, from, uh, from coming from the Blue Ridge Mountains and coming from the western mountains on the western side of the Tennessee Valley. Um, one of the important developments, of course, with the Tennessee Valley was the development of, um, of, of power. Um, and from that perspective, uh, Lilienthal indeed was um, was victorious over Arthur Morgan in pushing power as one of the, uh, the key aspects uh, of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, this uh, system of reservoirs, many of these uh, were uh, indeed uh, multi-purpose dams that provi provided flood production uh, and power production. One of, the, uh, one of the difficulties that arose from <coughs> the system of reservoirs was how you operated the system of reservoirs, not just an individual reservoir. Um, so as Professor Billington noted earlier in the class, uh, power um, is going to be the product, or it's going to be proportional to the product of discharge and head. Well, if you release water, uh, that's going to give you discharge, uh, but it's going to draw down your pool, so you're going to be losing head, and you don't know how much water is going to be coming in. And we have a system of more than, uh, than 30 reservoirs uh, that are being managed. So one of the important developments of the Tennessee Valley Authority was de the development uh, of optimization procedures for hydropower production, not from a single dam, but from a system of reservoirs. How do you operate this system? That was one of the, uh, the early developments that had to be, um, that had to be um, addressed prior to uh, the optimal use of the resource, and that indeed was the, uh, the objective that, um, that both Morgan and Lilienthal had in mind. Uh, so there are complexities uh, uh, in power production, and in many ways Lilienthal won out with the Tennessee Valley Authority becoming um, a, an authority devoted principally to power production, uh, but, but he won out in, in some ways in the short term. Uh, he won out in the short term in that uh, currently the Tennessee Valley Authority is really not an especially uh, productive uh, power company. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, not a private, it's a public power company, but it made some bad decisions as, as private power companies did. It made bad decisions uh, in converting to nuclear power uh, before the costs associated with nuclear power were fully understood, and that's made uh, the TVA from a power production standpoint, uh, uh, not a real uh, uh, money winner. Uh, so the, the future of the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, in the 21st century is uncertain. One of the things that shows up here is there are a few small 
uh, headwater dams are actually denoted A here for uh, aluminum company projects. They actually weren't part of uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority construction program, but they were private dams. I think all of these are now owned by uh, Duke Power, which is a very successful private power company. And one way one can env envision the Tennessee Valley Authority evolving is that Duke Power will eventually uh, take over the TVA, its production and transmission capabilities, and it will just become a private uh, power company. So Lilienthal's vision led to cheap rural electricity, and it transformed uh, the Tennessee Valley region. Uh, but it did not lead to a permanent uh, change to the way public facilities uh, um, were managed, permanent in the sense that this will be a lasting um, uh, a lasting way of managing the Tennessee Valley region. And the water becomes of secondary importance in the Tennessee Valley to the power production. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, chief difficulties that was faced from this massive construction program was the actual design um, of the facilities themselves. So how do you, how do you size uh, all of these facilities? What I want to look at for the remainder of the course or some of this, this lecture is some of the issues that were, uh, were wrestled with in the Tennessee Valley Authority and subsequently uh, in designing um, dams. Designing dams. Um, design flood, uh, this definition of design flood is taken from a Tennessee Valley Authority document. So it basically states that the design flood is just the flood magnitude and flood characteristics uh, that are used for determining the, uh, the size of outlet works, uh, the height of a dam, or the uh, level of conservation storage within a reservoir. So the design flood became one of the key aspects um, in specifying uh, the design of a dam. For the spillway in particular, the design flood determined uh, how much concrete had to be poured. So by the time uh, that Arthur Morgan had turned his attention to the Tennessee Valley Authority, the design standard for high hazard floods had become the probable maximum flood. Probable maximum flood uh, here, we're just going to to translate this as it's the flood that results from the probable maximum precipitation. So our attention is now going to, is going to focus on probable maximum precipitation as a design standard. We'll come back to probable maximum flood. So how do you take the, the probable maximum precipitation and convert it uh, into a flood magnitude and a flood <laughs> volume? Uh, but for now, the issue is probable maximum precipitation. Now, the, the previous um, version, the uh, uh, definition of design flood was taken uh, from a 1930s Tennessee Valley Authority document. These definitions of probable maximum precipitation and probable maximum flood are definitions that are taken from 1990 World Meteorological Organization uh, <coughs> publication. So these are the current definitions of probable maximum precipitation and probable maximum flood. The World Meteorological Organization's version here is actually taken directly uh, from that of the National Weather Service of the United States, which now is the organization which prepares probable maximum flood assessments for the United States. So that evolved from the 1930s when the program that Arthur Morgan had set up by the Miami Conservancy was first adopted by the Tennessee Valley Authority, then by the Corps of Engineers, ultimately by the Bureau of Reclamation, to become the standard uh, for design practice. So the, the catch here is that in the definition, probable maximum precipitation, it's the greatest depth of precipitation. And now there, there's some details for a given duration. Uh, and then there's uh, at a particular location. But the, the, the catch here is it's physically possible. That's the definition. And so that's the design standard. Um, we have to figure out what, the, what the, the physical upper bound on precipitation is. Now, the, the details 
uh, the probable maximum precipitation uh, for six hours would be different from 24 hours. Um, over a given area, the probable maximum precipitation for a 100 square mile area would be different for that for a 1,000 square mile area. And it might be different in Minnesota than in South Florida uh, or Colorado. So those are the elements. We've got uh, we, we, the probable maximum precipitation can vary uh, with location. Uh, we have to specify it uh, for an area and for a time. Now, if you're going to design a structure then, uh, and the drainage area is 1,000 square miles, you're obviously interested in the 1,000 square mile value of the probable maximum precipitation. So this is the, this is the design standard. And in various guises, uh, it has been the design standards uh, since the 1930s. Um, the probable maximum precipitation is a very important quantity today, not because we're building dams, uh, but because we have to assess the safety of dams, and we have to maintain dams. So the problem uh, in the 21st century is one of infrastructure maintenance. Now, infrastructure maintenance is particularly complicated by the fact that the procedures used to compute probable maximum precipitation have evolved uh, since the 1930s and changed. So the probable maximum precipitation when Norris Dam was designed would be different from uh, what it is today. Now, that turns out to be important because um, the tendency has been for the design standards to increase for probable maximum precipitation values to increase over time. And it translates into a very, very large cost associated with retrofitting existing structures to meet this design standard. The National Research Council estimated that the costs to retrofit existing federal dams to meet probable maximum precipitation standards is on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars. So the costs are, uh, are quite large. And in fact, they're costs that are beyond what we can, uh, we can expend. So we have to look um, at these procedures from a rational perspective and figure out the best ways of, of managing the risks that are posed by um, existing structures. Now, what I'm going to do, so probable maximum precipitation, there have been a variety of procedures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to show you um, how a probable maximum precipitation storm works. Okay. And uh, in showing you, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to follow one line of development that, in, that became popular in the 30s and 40s uh, for computing probable maximum precipitation. And it was to, to sort of tick off what are the physical elements that come into producing precipitation at a given time in a given area. Let's maximize them. Okay. So the meteorological attack was based on um, the deployment in the 1930s of weather balloons so that you had information about the atmosphere. And it turns out the important information about the atmosphere was water in the atmosphere, not surprisingly, but water uh, in gaseous phase, not in uh, liquid or solid phase. So in the 30s and the 40s, people tried to estimate probable maximum precipitation by just sort of maximizing you know, how much water they could get out of the air. And uh, that's really the, the, the vantage point that I'm going to take. Um, and, and the storm that I'm going to, the, the PMP storm that I'm going to look at um, is the storm that produced the flood uh, in the Rapidan River Basin in 1995, the storm for which we saw the video of that, that large flood. And if you recall, I, I showed this for just setting the location. So we're, uh, we're right along the east slope of the Blue Ridge in Virginia. We're close to, we're about 30 miles from Charlottesville, Virginia. And the thing I showed before, didn't emphasize, this is the track of the storm. So this distance here is on the order of 20 miles. And in particular, it's this uh, six-hour period in here that we're interested in. So what we're, we'll really be looking at is going to be a six-hour PMP storm. And it's over an area uh, of about 100 square kilometers. Now, you see these, all these red lines? All these red lines are debris flows and avalanches that were mapped by the Geological Survey. 
Uh, so this was a storm that produced not just uh, tremendous flooding, uh, but landslides and debris flows uh, in this forested region. Okay, so this is going to be the, the storm that, uh, that we want to look at. This is the boundary of the 300 square kilometer Rapidan River Basin. The video was taken right here at the outlet of the basin. And this shows the, uh, the rainfall accumulation for the storm. So the peak, we have this closed contour at 600 millimeters. The peak was a little over 700 millimeters. So we're talking uh, 28 inches of rain in about six hours. How in the world do you do that? Okay, so that's the question. Um, so we're, we're thinking now in terms of something like a hundred square kilometer uh, PMP at six hour time period. And this, uh, this ellipse here is an area of a little larger than a hundred square kilometers. Okay, so that's going to be the tack. Now, uh, it, it turns out Morgan's idea for probable maximum precipitation computation was that you just measured the uh, every a tremendous storm that, uh, that occurred. And you use that data to create storm catalogs. And so now this data, in fact, this image here is part of the National Weather Service's <coughs> storm catalog following Morgan's procedures. Um, and that data is used in probable maximum precipitation computation. And the basis, the basic idea behind probable maximum precipitation, if you want to build a, a dam on a 100 square mile area outside of Richmond, you just move this storm over there, okay? And you sort of flip it around to sort of maximize the rain over an area. And then you see what the, the flood magnitude is. That's, that's basically uh, Morgan's idea. Now you do that with all the storms in the area that have occurred and that are part of your storm catalog. That's the basis. The, the, one, the one catch that's been around from the 1930s is, is this idea of you maximize the storm. You sort of blow it up a little bit by saying, what if the air had more water uh, than it did on that particular day? And the way that's done is you figure out how much, what's the most water you can put into the air, and you figure out how much water uh, was in the air that particular day, and you just sort of scale it up. So in a, in a nutshell, that's the, that's the method that, that Morgan uh, was advocating in the 30s, and basically is the, is the conventional practice uh, to today. But what, what we want to think about now is, you know, if you look at the, uh, all of the ingredients of a storm, how do you optimize them? And, and is this really optimizing uh, rainfall over this area over a time period of around six hours? Now, this is, a, this is an image from a weather radar, and it shows the storm. It shows uh, two perspectives. This is, uh, this is just a, um, a horizontal slice of the storm about two kilometers above the ground. Now, uh, this blue area uh, here is about 10 kilometers uh, by four kilometers. So those are the rough dimensions of the storm. Um, this is just a vertical slice through the storm along this line. A vertical slice, well, this is 12 kilometers above the ground kind of see this green at the top. Uh, the, the green is going to just be cloud, uh, cloud water. Uh, the yellows are going to be really intense rain. Um, so here's the core of intense rain in the storm, and the tops of the clouds go up to about 12 kilometers. Now, if you watch the video closely, uh, you may have seen a lightning strike. Did anyone see that? If you watch real closely, you saw a lightning strike. Well, now this is a thunderstorm. Okay. Um, and so it's got, you know, it's, if, you, if you flew over this thing, it would be a pretty impressive sight to see. Um, so this is, a, this is a 3D look at the storm. And now we want to figure out, you know, how it worked. At this particular time, um, in this little yellow core here, uh, there, there are rain rates that are, gosh, they're, they're somewhere between 300 and 400 millimeters per hour. Um, and, and that magnitude rain rates, you know, it's occurred in, in several of these PMP storms. And, and an interesting thing is getting the stories. Uh, people are invariably caught out in the rain. Um, and the stories all have the same, same element to them. Uh, they, they refer to one feature. Uh, they feel as though they're drowning. 
Okay, so that's, the, that's your mental image is they are out in the open, they feel as though they're drowning. And when they reach uh, shelter, it's as though they've broken water. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of rainfall that, uh, that we're dealing with in this little core of extreme rain. So the question is, uh, the question is, how do you do that? So this is a PMP storm. How do you, how do you get that much uh, rain into the ground? Well, um, what we're going to have to look at now is how much water you can put in the air. And so the, for, for right now, what I want you to, to think of is, uh, is just a cubic meter of air, a cubic meter of air in this room. And we're going to <coughs> characterize how much water is in a cubic meter of air in this room or outside. Uh, we're going to do it in two ways here. One is uh, through the water vapor density, just the mass of water uh, divided by the volume, and then through the vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of the water vapor is just the partial pressure uh, of water, the part of air uh, that is water. Okay, so these are the two of the ways in which we're going to characterize how much water is in the air. Water vapor density, rho sub V, and the vapor pressure, E. Now, um, the, the fundamental problem we have to deal with is, the, so how much water is in the air here? <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, you can't see it. You don't have, you have, you have really no good intuition. If you, uh, obviously, if you went to a lake, you know, you've got a cubic meter of water. Okay, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter liquid water. All right, I mean, you know, you can, you can deal with that, but uh, air. Okay, we're dealing with, with water as a gas in the air. We've got to figure out how much, uh, how much there is. Um, there, you know, so there are two sides of it. We want to figure out how much there is relative to, uh, uh, to that 700 millimeters of rain. Okay, and, and how, you know, the air in vapor phase contributes to the, uh, to the 700 meters that reach the ground as uh, liquid water. Um, Okay, the other thing is we've got to figure out a way of measuring uh, water. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's look at one of the, the basic tools that we can use, and that's the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law, pressure equals density gas constant times temperature. The only catch here is we're looking at the partial pressure of water vapor. Okay, so what we've got is the water vapor density and we have to use the gas constant for water. Okay, so um, this gives us a relationship now between the vapor pressure and the water vapor density, uh, and it introduces the, uh, the dependence on temperature. Okay, this is going to be one of our basic tools for uh, computing how much water is in the air, but, but we, need, uh, we need a basic concept uh, to, to speed us on our way. Uh, and that concept turns out to be saturation. Um, so it turns out if you take this uh, cubic meter of air uh, under the current conditions here, that there, there's, a, there's a maximum amount of water that can, it can hold okay, under the pressure and temperature here the air outside uh, may be different. Um, saturation is going to give us a way of doing our computation and it's the fundamental aspect in this transition from vapor to liquid. Okay, the notion, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. The new notion here is saturation vapor pressure. The new notion that goes along with saturation. So now if we took this cubic meter of air uh, and we put all of the water in it that we could in gaseous phase, what would the vapor pressure be? Okay, so that's the saturation vapor pressure. Now the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, this is actually an approximate solution to the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Um, and it's not important just for 
this, uh, this tool that we'll be use, using for computations. But it's important for what it says. It says, you know, what matters? How much water can you put uh, in this cubic meter of air? Uh, it depends only on the temperature. Okay, so the temperature controls the amount of water that can be held in gaseous phase in the air. And the relationship is given by the clausius clausius equation. Okay, now in, in doing computations uh, on exercises, um, I formulated everything so we, we stay uh, really uh, vanilla pure SI. So you've got to use degrees Kelvin uh, in computations uh, and so forth. So in, uh, keep track uh, closely of units in, uh, in using these equations. Okay, so the amount, of the, the amount of water that can be held depends only on temperature. Well, the final notion that we need is that of the dew point temperature, because that turns out to be the quantity that we can measure. What's a, what's a dew point of 75 degrees? What is that? It gets that cold, it's going to start raining. What's that? Yeah, but but in t you know, what does it mean to you, 75 degree dew point? It gets that cold, it's, the it's going to start raining. Yes. No, I mean, I mean on, a, on a more visceral level. Do you form in the grass? Pardon? Do you form on the grass and like where the, the water is humid? Yeah, it's humid. 75 degree dew point is, yeah, that's, that's tremendous. Okay. So what it means is one thing. You know, it means uh, a dew point of 24 degrees Celsius, which is about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, a dew point temperature means that's, that's, how much you have to cool the parcel so that it becomes saturated. Okay, that's what it, that's that's right. That's the definition. But a dew point of 24 degrees centigrade, oh my gosh, that's you know, that's uh, that's July sweltering weather in the south. Okay. Um, now, so the dew point temperature, so the the the, the saturation vapor pressure is given by the temperature. Okay, what's the, what's the vapor pressure? Oh, the vapor pressure can be the actual vapor pressure. It's just the Clausius Clapeyron equation evaluated at the dew point temperature. Okay, so this becomes the nice tool. So dew point temperature turns out we can devise, uh, we, can, we can modify thermometers to give us the dew point temperature. So now we have two instruments, basically. We've got a thermometer and we've got a modified thermometer to give us the dew point temperature. And, and it turns out that gives us everything we need to know about water in the atmosphere. Now, so here, just inverting the ideal gas law for the water vapor density, we've got it expressed as vapor pressure, which we can compute from dew point. Uh, and the gas constant for water vapor, 461 uh, joules per degree Kelvin per kilogram, and then the temperature that we measure from our thermometer. So the, we, we've got some conceptual advances uh, through the notion of, uh, of saturation uh, and saturation being dependent on temperature. We've also got the computational tool that we need, the measurement tool that we need. Yeah. In that equation, seeing that you have the minus 273, that may, makes me think that TD is in um, Celsius. But then <laughs> yeah. at the bottom, that one would be in That's all, Yeah, so the, the standard way of giving this equation is for temp dew point temperature in degrees Celsius. But in the bottom equation there, you'd be measuring T in Kelvin. Yeah. Well, now both of these are, de are, are in degrees Kelvin. But in the, low, the equation below that. Here, degrees Kelvin. Everything, everywhere I show a temperature is degrees Kelvin. Now this approximate solution was actually developed uh, and is typically expressed as T divided by, uh, what would that be, T plus 273, so something like uh, T plus 225 or something like that. It's typically expressed in terms of uh, of temperature in centigrade. And I've just translated it so that everything is in degrees Kelvin. Oh, okay, and the 273 is there because that's a difference. That's the, I guess would be the freezing. Right, point. yeah. So this is, this is, as you observe, that's just the temperature in degrees centigrade. 
Okay, so um, an example. Uh, this isn't any example, by the way. This is, uh, this is basically the conditions that prevail on the east slope of the Blue Ridge near Charlottesville on June 27th of 1995 in the early morning. <coughs> so from the Charlottesville surface station, uh, the dew point is, that's, that's high. Um, and we're near saturation. Okay, so we just compute the vapor pressure using the Clausius Clapeyron equation and the dew point temperature. Okay, here I use I use the these two the same to just to emphasize the fact that in storms like the Rapid N storm. Uh, the temperature is going to be close to the, we're going to be close to saturation, close to the surface. But that's the only point for the example being formulated in that way. So the temperature is always going to be larger, uh, greater than or equal to the dew point temperature. Okay, so the vapor pressure, just under 3,000 pascals. Uh, the water vapor density, now we know how much water is there. 22 grams um, in a cubic meter. Yeah, 22 grams in a cubic. It doesn't sound like a whole lot. It turns out that's a lot. That's a lot uh, of water in a cubic meter. Okay. And well, you can take that from 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius dew point temperature. Maybe that gives the sort of interpretation of the uh, to you of the humidity. This doesn't. You know, this has no uh, no uh, strong interpretation in terms of magnitude of water. Okay, the concept that uh, Morgan used for adjusting storms like the Rapid End Storm was that of precipital water. So the precipital water is a simple notion. Now we take, we take a square meter and we take a column of the atmosphere that has dimensions a square meter up to the top of the atmosphere and how much water is in that sample volume. That one meter by one meter by 10,000 meter sample volume. Precipital water. Total mass of water vapor extending up to the top of the atmosphere. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of air up at 10,000 meters, not a whole lot. Turns out there's not any water. <coughs> um, but let's just look at, let's just look at a tremendous, a tremendous uh, overestimate of how much water you can put uh, in our atmospheric column. Let's assume we've got our 24 degrees temperature dew point for 10 kilometers. I have a question. Yeah. Wouldn't it, when you go up high in the atmosphere, it gets colder? So it gets colder, exactly. So exactly. Yeah, so the temperature drops between 6 and 10 degrees Kelvin per kilometer, so we're going to be at about minus 80 degrees centigrade um, at 10 kilometers. But, you know, but here, you know, forget that. So it's 24 degrees, 10 kilometers on. Well, if that's the case, then our precipitable water is just our water vapor density times 10,000 meters. So our kilograms per square meter, 220, and that's 220 millimeters. Okay, and here's where we finally get back to rainfall. Okay. And here's where we finally get, uh, get to a point where we can start comparing to rainfall. So all I did here is I took my 220 kilograms per square meter, and I divided by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, the density of liquid water. But then I had to multiply by 1,000 millimeters per meter to convert back to millimeters. Okay. So um, if we took this heroic assumption of 24 degrees, which is you know, uh, sultry and sticky at the surface, all the way up to 10 kilometers, we, you know, we get something that's less than a third of what the rapid end did uh, on that day. So one, one idea is that you, know, you just sort of take, your, take the water that's in an atmospheric column and put it on the ground. 
That doesn't work. Now, not only does that not work, it doesn't come very close. Um, what I've shown here for July is just the average value of precipitable water. And I've shown it, it's based on all these X's turn out to be sites where the National Weather Service launches meteorological balloons. And they've been doing this since the 1930s. So this is a long climatology uh, of water in the air. Now, um, the values range from about 55 millimeters in the Gulf to a minimum in, in the Intermountain West of less than 10 millimeters. Okay, so we have large spatial um, gradients and moisture. They're really dictated by mountains, mountains, um, and bathtub here. Okay, so we thought of the uh, what does the Mississippi River do, do? It takes water sediment and dissolved material from the Rockies to the Gulf. What storms do is they take water from the Gulf and put it back in the U.S. Okay, so that's the way rainfall works, at least over the United States east of the, of the Mississippi, uh, and uh, particularly during the, uh, during the summer season. Okay, but 50, uh, 55 millimeters, the largest precipitable water value ever observed in the United States is on the order of uh, 75 to 80 millimeters. So we can't just condense all the water and uh, make much of a storm by doing that. So the idea of, you know, if we we're going to maximize precipitation, you know, sort of cramming more water statically into a column, you know, that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, the question is, how did the Rapidan storm do it? All right, so now, now we're going to come up with a, a simplified uh, picture of how this storm worked. And our picture is going to be, we're going to take um, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer box around this storm. And our, my box is going to be oriented north, south, east, west. Okay, and we're going to look at how much water comes into that box. Now, a thunderstorm, so the basic idea here is that you, in a thunderstorm, is that you have these upward vertical motions. Upward vertical motions are, eh, that's what you need for rain, because you need to lift water and, and lift it to the point where it becomes saturated and condenses. Uh, and thunderstorms are one of the good mechanisms for lifting air parcels. So now, my model here is going to be that um, I have a hose off the Atlantic, and the hose is coming straight out of the east. It's a hose, but it's a hose uh, of water and gaseous phase. Okay, uh, and that's really going to be the model for the storm. And it's a hose that's at um, fairly low portions of the storm. In fact, it's coming in here. This is looking west to east, and my hose is precisely coming in right like that. And the water comes in, it goes up, and it comes back down. And that's just the, that's just the way this thing works. OK, so that's the model. And let's, uh, let's see what that does now in terms of, uh, of, uh, of coming up with 700 millimeters of rain. Um, well, I've got one more observation to show you. So this is a, this is a weather radar. Whether it's, it turns out it's a Doppler radar. So it actually measures winds in addition to measuring hydrometers in the atmosphere. And so I, I, actually, I actually know what the hose looks like. And let me show you a picture uh, of the hose. Now, it may not look exactly like a hose to you, but this is the hose here. This is a representation of the wind in the vertical. So this is height um, from zero reference to the ground yeah. up to six kilometers. This is direction. Uh, it turns out it's really about 110 degrees from north. OK, so that's kind of east-southeast off the Atlantic. So we have wind blowing from the east-southeast. And here's the hose. From the surface up to one and a half kilometers, uh, we have this peak of about 13 meters per second uh, that's about 700 meters above ground surface. And averaged over this one and a half, lower one and a half meters, we've got 10 meters per second. Right, so that's the hose. Now we measured the humidity, and the humidity turns out to be this, uh, this 22 grams per cubic meter. Uh, we, we know that's what's coming in with this. OK, and let's see what that translates to. A 
apologies for the uh, for the artwork here. But here we've got our you know our 10 meter, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer box, 10 meters per second on this face. Zero in from the south, zero out toward the north, zero out to the west. Okay. So comes in, goes up, comes down. That simple. <coughs> so the box 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers by one and a half. And remember the one and a half was, was, is from the wind. Okay. So the east face 10 meters per second, zero elsewhere and 22 grams per cubic meter. <clears throat> All right, what will that buy us? Let's see. Oops. Yeah. What will that buy us? Sorry. I was anxious to tell you what it would buy us. <laughs> <coughs> okay, everybody set? Ready? Good. <laughs> okay, well, let's look. So I, we've got 10,000 by 1,500 meters okay, times 10 meters per second. So the air coming in, we've got one and a half times 10 to the 8 cubic meters per second. That's just air coming in. Yeah. Exactly where do you tell where the top of the atmosphere is? I mean, what is this 10,000? No, 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 no. This is, this is horizontal. This is on the surface. This is um, okay. on, along the ground surface. OK. So now we've got, um, we've got the storm has dimensions of 10 kilometers by one and a half, the inflow to it. Oh, OK. Okay. But even in previous examples, like how do you tell what, what you mean talking about a column that's 10,000? Well, the, it, it turns out it really, in, in looking at water, it doesn't matter where you pick it because uh, most of the water is in the lower two or three kilometers of the atmosphere. The computations of uh, uh, precipitable water will go up to, uh, say, 10 kilometers. The, uh, the, the water vapor density at, uh, at five kilometers is going to be less than 0 0.0001 kilograms per cubic meter. So it's going to be very small, typically, because of the decrease in temperature. But the thing here is this is not, this is at the, uh, we've got a 10 kilometer wide area along the Rapidan Basin by one and a half kilometer high area that's the inflow for air at low levels into the storm. OK, is that clear? Ten, <coughs> 10 kilometers wide by one and a half kilometer high. That's the inflow to the storm. And then 10 meters per second is the velocity of the air. So we get uh, this much air coming in. How much water we just multiply by 0 0.022 kilograms per cubic meter. <coughs> so we've got 3.3 times 10 to the 6 kilograms per second. And now just uh, divide by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And we've got inflow of water, a volumetric inflow <coughs> rate, more than 3,000 cubic meters per second. 3,000 cubic meters per second of water. Okay, so that's uh, the Delaware River in flood okay, coming, coming into the storm as water vapor. OK. What is that bias? Well, now rain rate. So we've got 3,300 cubic meters per second coming in. But we've got, it's, uh, you know, th so the, it's, it comes in, it goes up, it comes back down. And then we're saying we're going to spread it over a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer surface area. All right, in, up, down. So divide by our 10 to the 8 square meters, and we've got 3.3, what in the world is that, uh, times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second 
Well, just convert it to millimeters per hour, 119 millimeters per hour, or 714 millimeters during the six hours of the storm. So we took the computation here is simply um, a dew point measurement of how much water is in the air, a measurement of the temperature. Those give us the amount of water in the air. And then we, uh, we just have to, we have to figure out what the hose is. And that's the flow of of water associated with the air. So the new side is it's not just taking water in the column, condensing it, having it come down. The, the ball game is getting water is, is the transport side. And it's the winds that are the hardest part, the 10 meters per second. Well, why couldn't it be 20 meters per second and then 1,400? And that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the problem that everyone has crashed into when they've tried to directly assess upper bounds. It's the wind. <laughs> The wind limits, and the convergence of winds into an area is what limits precipitation and determines maximum precipitation. As a consequence, the distribution of rainfall from tremendous storms are used. The way this is used, in fact, and has been used for sizing um, uh, dams in the Virginia Piedmont is um, it was 52 millimeters of precipitable water uh, on June 27, 1995. The largest value for this area is 60. So whatever 60 divided by 52 is, these were multiplied by that, and that becomes the probable maximum precipitation. OK, so these, these, um, these procedures have been developed over um, uh, a period of, uh, of uh, 50, 60, 70 years. They've evolved. The numbers have evolved, leading to different levels of safety for different structures. Those are the issues that we have to contend with in looking at our, uh, our infrastructure from uh, particularly these large uh, dams in the United States. Okay, see you on Thursday.